name is Aaron Ra. I am the Southwest Regional Director of American Atheists. And uh, I'm very proud that I am also the director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, which will be my contribution to science. And uh, I, I'm an internet activist. I run a YouTube channel and a Patreon. And for the last four years, uh, that's been my full-time gig. And I, I've been to a bunch of different places. I was speaking for a long time at, at, at a different location where right I would have to fly, you know, travel to speak every month, you know, and it'd be uh, every state, I think almost every state in the country, 22 countries, and it's been it's been a great ride. Tell me a little bit more about the project you're taking on. What was that again? The Phylogeny Explorer Project is an attempt to render the entire taxonomic tree of life as a navigable online encyclopedia. There have been a couple of attempts at this before. Uh, the Arizona Tree of Life project was the best one done so far. But the thing is, is they, what they did with that was they had uh, they'd hired a bunch of PhDs to effectively build a uh, or to effectively build a website. And costs, of course, went through the roof. There was no way to continue funding on something like that. Now they made a valiant attempt, but they also left out a number of fossil groups. Proplapithecoidea, for example, cannot be found in the Arizona Tree of Life project. And that's an important one that we need to include. And so what I'm doing is I'm working on a project where I've got a handful of volunteers and we've, uh, we've invested quite a bit in getting uh, the database built. Uh, this is the second version. The first version of the database looked fair enough and, and we thought, okay, we'll work with this. And as soon as we started putting volumes of data into it, it collapsed. So we had to get a different engineer and a whole new system and uh, now, it's, now it seems to be withstanding. We've got 30,000 individual species entered so far. And from, a, from as I said, a, a half a dozen to a dozen guys working on it. And, they, and we're, we're still learning how to do that. We're still following, you know, developing the rules for how we want to lay this out. Uh, one of the things that we're, that we're doing is like straying away from the old Linnaean taxonomy. You know, the, the, the kingdom, phylum, genus, family, you know, we don't always have to have that. Sometimes there's only a single representative and I don't need a straight line. You know, we've got wonderful curves going around. There's a beautiful rendition. If there's only one representative species, then we don't need to see all these other ranks. So we, so we have a rule that we just implemented and we're going to go back and correct some of these others where uh, we, every clade should have a choice between at least two, you know, but not just one. You know. But anyway... I, I'm sidetracking. The thing is, where a lot of other cladograms exist on the web to show you, you know, like how many different species there are or give you the, the idea that there is a tree of life, we're showing you what the tree of life actually means. I and mean, what, what does each of these clades mean? I and mean, the clades would be like when you follow the branch of the tree and you come to a fork and it goes two different ways. That place, this is a clade and it includes all of the descendants from that point on. And then the next branch will be the next clade and so forth. And where, where these relate to Linnaean taxonomy is like mammal. Everybody knows what a mammal is, right? You have mammaries and you know, warm-blooded and hair and all of these other, these other traits. Well, we, there's actually, there's so many, uh, just, to, just in human uh, phylogeny, there are so many different clades. That I, I made a series of videos that I'm, where I'm explaining these and I'm about halfway through it and I've got 23 episodes and some of these clades are, are doubled or tripled up per episode, just to give you an idea. So dozens and dozens. So you say tree of life. Yeah. I feel like I know what that means. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take a guess and you correct me. Okay. Tree of life is as far back as we can go. We start with a species or groups of species, and then we show how they form into other species from there. All right, help me out. Okay, that, well, obviously mammal is not a species. Mammal is a huge encompassing, uh, and, and a lot of people will think that ape is a species, but no, ape is actually a, in the, in the Linnaean taxonomy, it's a super group, it's a super family. So not a species again, but these may be represented by individual species. So we'll depict the individual species when there is only one, but there's a clade that covers that, that, uh, that is the larger category. That what, what are the classifications or criteria required to be this? And people don't realize that, they're, you know, that they think that there's, there's reptiles and amphibians and mammals and all of that is, is wrong. I mean, the mammal classification for, for you know, the criteria we just went over actually come from predecessor groups. And there's just this, it, the, the, the intricacy and volume of the tree of life is far beyond what 
most laymen could imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it's much bigger than you think it could be. Uh, I did, uh, I worked for like three days on the classification of snakes. That, just snakes, was voluminous. I mean, we're talking about thousands. And it's not just the, it's not just the species. It's where the species go in relation to everything else. Where do they branch so that you get this subcategory versus, and this, this, this category contains these categories, which contain these categories. And then you end up with so many species, you can't even read them all. There's so many. But it's the way the tree is interconnected, and it's the criteria or the, the character traits that each of these groups develop. And the interesting thing for evolution was, Carolus Linnaeus was a, uh, was a creationist. He lived 100 years before Darwin. He thought that species were immutable, that species could not change into other species. But when he started to classify all the, the tree of life, that's when he discovered it, it was a tree. He was expecting boxes of created kinds. But what he got was subcategories within subcategories within subcategories, which do not make sense from a creationist standpoint. So he challenged the scientific community to explain why humans and apes are the same damn thing. Because he couldn't tell them apart. And he said so. I can't tell them apart. Now, modern creationists would say that would, would think that ape is like a species. Maybe they think it's just chimpanzees. They don't understand all the other species that exist today. And they certainly don't understand the wealth of species that exist in the fossil record. And one of the things that I'm showing with the series that I'm doing on video and also with the tree is the, is the, the volume of extinct fauna way outweighs the million or so species that we have alive today. It's stunning how much stuff is already extinct. And the, and the, the biodiversity that went away in previous extinction events, it's... Uh, it's humbling to realize how little we have. The, the million or so species that everybody thinks is so many today isn't really significant compared to everything that went before. Huge classifications of animals completely wiped out. How do we know that? How do we know that there was huge classifications of animals completely wiped out? Well, uh, in one of my series, I talk about different kinds of fish that existed in the Devonian. And several different species in each category for fish that have these character traits versus this character trait and versus this other group. And there's like five or six of them that are all very diverse. They all have lots of different species in each of these categories. And no fish alive today meets any of these criteria. These are all massive families of fish, all gone, every last one of them. And people will say, well, you know, they, they thought that the, the coelacanth was extinct and they found one. So that proves that evolution isn't true. But... They do have two modern species of coelacanth, and neither one of them are the same species as the seven or eight species that are found in the fossil record. And they're actually different families of coelacanth. They're not even individual species. These are different family groups. So there's, again, even with coelacanths, okay, you, you found the last two surviving species so far, and we have these family groups in the fossil record that are not the same thing we have. You know, so you can't ever say that it's the same species as, as existed, you know, 18 million years ago. No, they're, they're clearly not. You can't, this is the species we have. These are the species we had. They're, okay, you have bats here, you have fish here, you have lizards here, and you have these things today, but they're not the same species. That's not what species means. So people don't understand that we have like, uh, within the fossil record, we have 50 different species of apes that don't exist today. And we have only like seven or eight species that exist now, ourselves included. So a lot of people don't understand that we are apes in the same sense that an iguana is a lizard and a lion is a cat. Explain that then, because people will look around and we're going to see ourselves as completely different from what we call monkeys, apes, chimpanzees, et cetera, et cetera. So how are we the same? Okay. Uh, and, and this is what fa is fascinating to me about uh, my, my thing has always been, ever since I was a little kid, the classification of life has always been fascinating to me. Uh, a, a teacher in second grade gave me a, a book on dinosaurs and it had a cladogram in it. And when I saw how dinosaurs were related to birds, related to lizards, and the, the, the categories of life, I realized, well, that, made, that explains all their character traits. That explains why they look like this. So when you're talking about evolution, as we mentioned, uh, vertebrate, for example, has a, has a backbone. Right, the spinal cord in it. Well, we have that. So you get, get this is the classification. This is the criteria. 
any animal that has this vertebrae is a vertebrate. You have it, I have it, we are vertebrates. We can't, we can't say that, no, we just look like a vertebrate. No, you have the criteria, you have the defining characteristics that makes you that thing. Mm -hmm. So mammal, you know, nobody says we look like a mammal or we're similar to a mammal. We are mammals. So it gets more in depth. So this is where it gets a little creepy for people. And they say, well, you think, you, you, you're, you think we're all come from primates. And I say, no, I think we are primates. Right. Okay. And here are the criteria for primates. You can't describe all of the character traits held in common by every species of monkey without describing people. When you go into the subgroup and describe every all the character traits that define or or that separate old world monkeys from new world monkeys, if you're if you're describing old world monkeys, all their character traits, you're describing people. When you get into the subset of that and describe what apes are, hominoidia, you describe people. And when you describe great apes, you describe people. And there's there's not a character trait that all the great ape, great apes have, but that we don't, including right down to our genetics. I mean they. The other existing or the other current apes all have, uh, I think it's 24 chromosomes, and we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And people will say, well, that's a marked difference, except that now we know that uh, one of our chromosomes is actually a fusion of two different ape chromosomes. Okay. Uh, they're they're uh, no, our number two and another, another one that they don't have, or that we don't have, is, is fused into one. And... Uh, you can do, or geneticists have shown, or not geneticists, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not even sure what the term is, but you, microbiologists, let's say, uh, have gone into, uh, and, and this is like literally a textbook author on microbiology, Kenneth Miller, was one of the star witnesses in Kitzmiller versus Dover on against intelligent design, and he showed how this number two chromosome at exactly this point was fused between these other two chromosomes, and here are all the indicators to show that that's what this was. And that was a point of divergence from which people came and it separated us in that characteristic, <laughs> in that characteristic from apes existing now. Pretty much. Yeah. Still though, we're all considered primates. We're all mammals, we're all, all mammals. vertebrates. Yeah. And something, uh, I don't know if it was just that chromosome difference, but something somewhere led to us looking more like this and them looking more like that. Yeah, and it's actually, a long, it's actually a long string of mutations that they're charting now. They're going back through our genome and they're able to find the mutation that changed. Why we have a smaller jaw than the other apes, which is why we also have impacted wisdom teeth. We still have the same number of teeth, it's just that our jaw isn't big enough to house them anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're, they're looking at certain cultures that have a, a high degree of anagenesis in the Pax9 gene, which means that they don't ever develop uh, molars, which means that they don't ever have impacted wisdom teeth. So they're trying to figure out, is, it, is there a way that we can modify the human genome so that people are just born with this mutation already in place and therefore they don't have to risk this morbidity later in life? You know, there's some advantages to that. And one of the things that's interesting about our genome is that it's 8% of our genome is actually made of viruses that our ancestors have survived, but the virus has written into our genetic code its own DNA, and so we have like 8% of our genome is that, and then we have a number of other genes that no longer work, but that still work in monkeys. So we have defective monkey genes. There's no reason we should have monkey genes to begin with, but we have monkey genes that don't work. So <laughs> this is an argument against intelligent design. I wanna to try to put this, um, I wanna to try to spin what you just said in another way. Mm -hmm. So we have an instruction manual, our DNA, you know, et cetera. We have an instruction manual that as time goes on, some of it becomes obsolete. Um, but as apes have the same instruction manual as we have, we can look back at a point in time and see how it did apply to everything. Mm -hmm. um, these same set of instructions at one point affected them and affected us. But as time goes on, we can just identify parts of that instruction that is no longer useful to us but yet we still have it, they still have it. And we can make identifications of similarities that way. You could describe DNA as a code in a sense, but it's, it's one that writes itself. Okay. And we've seen it even, ju even just within humanity, even within recent generations, we've identified a number of specific mutations that have beneficial effect and that we would like to see recurrent. Uh, there's a myostatin mutation 
that kind of takes us back to the ape category in one respect. It gives us twice the muscle mass and half the fat. So, and there's no downside. There are, there are children that have, that have this mutation that are just strangely muscular for children. They're just, you know, they're stronger than their adult parents. You know, and there's not a, there's no downside to this. I mean, they, 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 they might eat more for the extra protein, but that's it. I mean, they're, they're Herculean kids. And there's, there's another mutation that uh, can lead to morbidity, but in one particular family group, there's no downside in there either. They have super dense, unbreakable bones. We're talking about people existing today. People existing today. Okay. So there's one, there, there have been other occurrences of super dense bones that lead to negative side effects. You know, mm-hmm. family groups do, do have these, but in this one family that I'm talking about, there's, they have no, none of these downsides. So they're looking at this specific type of mutation that gives them unbreakable bones. Now, let's, let's think of it. If we, could, if we could modify our own genes, like in the movie Gattaca, for example, we can have a child that is born never having to worry about impacted wisdom teeth, but who has you know, super strength and unbreakable bones and, and no uh, HDL serum cholesterol. And we, we can make Herculean super kids. You know, just out of the mutations that already exist. It's kind of like we make drugs out of what plants have already come up with. We just have to find a strange exotic plant that produces cocaine or produces, you know, what any of a number of other drugs. You know, like the gum tree that gets aspirin. You know, this, this is where all of our stuff comes from. We don't invent it. We find it in nature because nature diversifies so many times that it comes with all these different components and all these different uh, combinations. And then we find, well, look, this is this, does this, this, does that. So let's, let's work with it. The, our genome does the same thing. So we have these bizarre mutations that uh, that can be deleterious and uh, usually are insignificant. The difference is very often between siblings or close family relatives is a matter of mutation. Uh, it, it's a mix of your parents, but if you share the same parents, then we're looking at a difference in mutations between you know between different sperm. I mean, if if you if if the sperm that came in behind you came in in front of you, you know, then you would be somewhat different than you are. That's because everyone is slightly unique. The, the differences are usually insignificant. And as I said, the code writes itself. And we just we examine uh, not just what it can do, but also tracing the history back. Uh, we can now do like a genetic paternity test, you know, to identify, like on the Maury show, uh, you are the father. Well, we yeah. can do that now in an evolutionary basis. Uh, for example, once upon a time, and usually what happens is it, it is that they'll they'll confirm your original estimate. It's now that uh, taxonomy or phylogenetics is twin nested hierarchy, meaning you you base your initial analysis on the physical characteristics, and then you built this tree like Carolus Linnaeus did, you know, three hundred years ago. He he came up with a tree of life based on physical characteristics. Most of what he came up with is correct. And you can run, now run the genome for all these organisms, and it matches that, and it shows that yes, this is this is the actual lineage. But in a couple of cases, they guessed wrong. Uh, in one case, for example, uh, it was thought that the, you have fruit bats and you have the micro bats, the big bats and the little bats. And the little bats eat insects and the big bats eat fruit. And they thought that that was convergent because the big bats look so much like primates, they thought that they were primates. Well, when you run the genome, you find out that, that the bats are actually, that's not convergent, they, they arrive from the same thing. It just happens to look like an early primate, like a colugo or a, or a lemur with wings. Uh, but there was another one where they thought that anteaters, aardvarks, and um, pangolins had all lost their teeth as a single event and then diversified into these three groups. The, gene- the genetics says that no, they actually started out as individual groups, lost their teeth separately, and that aardvarks are actually closer to elephants and pangolins are closer to carnivores. So they, what we have is a, a system that will both Confirm and correct. If you are right, then it'll confirm that you're right. But it can also say, nope, you made a mistake here. This is what it actually is. So there's now a way to prove what the genealogy is. Really basic question here. How can we trust what the genetic information, how can we trust how we interpret what the genetic information tells us as far as where we come from, at what point did we diverge? That sort of thing. For somebody that doesn't know anything about genetics, DNA, all that sort of stuff, why should it mean anything to them? Okay. The, the answer to that would be uh, 
we are talking about a method of, of when we when I said we originally went to the the physical characteristics, right? You can test those out. Are these consistent? And like um, on occasion, you might find something that like it goes into a tetrapod class. You know, you have uh, things that have four four limbs, right? Developed for for living on land. A few other criteria too, but the simplified version is the tetrapods are four legged, and then you end up with snakes and whales. And we know that snakes and whales, we know from the fossil record that both of these used to have legs. There are fossil snakes that still have legs. They're tiny and they're useless, just like kind of you would expect. And this only has the hind legs. So there's snakes that only have their hind legs and their hind legs are so small, they couldn't have done anything. So the fossil record can now be used to confirm the taxonomy. And then, as I said, we have the, the genetics now that can go to either confirm or correct depending on, on what it was. So there are, there are multiple ways of testing. Embryology does the same thing. So there was a guy that uh, Ernst Haeckel once got something wrong. He thought that uh, the way that life develops in the womb uh, duplicated the way that it evolved. And he thought that it went through the, the, the adult stages. So that it would become an amphibian, then it would become a reptile, then it would become a mammal. And we have different classifications. So those words don't even mean what they did in his day anymore. But what actually happens is there is a certain amount of recapitulation in embryological development. And the way that the, embryo, the embryological development matches the evolutionary development is a field of science called evo-devo. And it's, but it, it's, the, uh, it's the developmental stages. So as you go through the development of a whale, for example, there are hind leg buds. That the, where the legs start to develop. They never develop into full legs, full feet like Ernst Teckel thought they would, but you do get the start of that development, and then it reverses. Then the legs are drawn back in again. The same thing happens with uh, glass snakes, which is a kind of legless lizard. Some of them have in their development where the legs still start to develop and then turn back in. And then there are genes that can be manipulated to, to show whether, whether or not it was possible for, uh, for our, our arguments about whether birds were once dinosaurs, for example. They find a gene in chickens that if you turn it on at the right stage of development, it grows teeth. Wow. Now, if, if chickens were intelligently designed to be birds, and birds were always birds, then why the hell would it have a gene to make teeth? And it's just a matter of, of the chemical switch that doesn't exist in them anymore, so they don't develop teeth normally. And... and um, unless you alter it. And the same thing can be done with their arms, the same thing can be done with their tails. You, know, you can do a certain degree of reverse engineering with some of these animals. Depends on how far back it was, how far, how far into concrete it was. Another example is atavism. Sometimes people are born with small tails. Uh, there was a dolphin uh, recently discovered that had four flippers. Because they originally had, it wasn't just the front flippers, they had hind legs too. The hind legs became flippers also. It's just that the hind legs weren't useful or they weren't necessary. So if, if, a, if a dolphin was born with the mutation to lose the hind legs, it didn't suffer from it. It did just as well, or in fact, it did better because it was actually faster and more efficient without those. So on occasion, that, uh, that switch can be thrown when it wasn't supposed to be thrown, and then you end up with something that has a tail when it shouldn't have a tail, or has teeth when it shouldn't have teeth, or has a four-flippered dolphin. Have you heard anything about CRISPR? No. <laughs> CRISPR, I think, is a technological medical method or device for editing our genome. Um, I don't know much about it. I was hoping you would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm embarrassed that I don't. I'm going to have to look it up. Yeah. Uh, C-R-I-S-P-E-R, -E exactly how it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it actually stands for anything. Did they discover this in, in looking at Hox genes? I have no idea. I'm going to tell you everything I know about CRISPR right now. You're able to edit your genetic code. And I believe that this has been put into practice uh, in some very limited way. Um, and then, you know, it has the effects that you might imagine it would have. The same effects you've been describing as the natural processes, these are now artificial ones. CRISPR. Again, I don't know if it stands for anything, but CRISPR. Okay. Um, I'd be interested to hear somebody who does all the work that you do uh, have an opinion on that and then project where you think that will take us. And speaking of projecting, um, fun question. Use your imagination here. Have fun with it. What would, what's the next mutation you would like to see in humanity? 
Now the next mutation I'd like to see is actually not in humanity. So wouldn't it be great if we could give intelligence to an animal that could use it? And if we're gonna get outside of monkeys, then the only other thing that has hands and can walk bipedally and, and manipulate objects that way is raccoons. <laughs>